A little girl and she went into the pet shop one day with her mom and they were looking around a little bit and the attendant came up and and the little girl says excuse me do you have any rabbits here and the salesperson thought that she was so cute and he knelt down you know with her and was kind of eye to eye and and he leaned in and says well honey would you like a, a little white rabbit or would you like a, a little brown rabbit or or maybe a, a fuzzy cute little black rabbit and she leaned back in and kind of shrugged her shoulder and says, I don't think my python really cares. <laughs> oh, oh. oh no, the, the rabbit lovers are, uh, are not happy with me. <laughs> um, last week we began a new series called Ungoogleable Joy. And we're exploring the book of Philippians and learning about Paul's love and encouragement for this church that he cared for so much. And uh, he helped start this church and uh, had made, during his time, made a couple of visits there. He kept in touch through notes and letters. And um, this is this, this letter of Philippians. He wrote to them just to help them kind of increase in their faith, their hope, and their joy. And we mentioned last week that we have kind of a national crisis of joy, if you will. That, um, that maybe there's a struggle there. Um, I think there's some, uh, uh, in your bulletin, there's some statistics that are coming from the My Hope campaign with Billy Graham. And we watched a little promo video of it last week and just this challenge to, uh, uh, to the church to mobilize people who will uh, uh, just take the message of Jesus and share it right from their home to maybe neighbors or family or whoever you'd invite to come in and share uh, some food together and then uh, uh, depending on how this works out there'll be either a video or there will be um, possibly a live broadcast um, that will be available uh, in sometime in November some of the details are still fuzzy, but it's, um, this is an immobilization time where we can get people from the church to get involved and consider being uh, what they're calling a Matthew house. That Matthew was just somebody that had Jesus come over to his house for a meal and he invited some friends to come and meet him. Um, out of your bulletin, this is in there, out of 100 neighbors, 100 people living right around you, seven of those are struggling with depression. You know, it's not just a sad day or they're having a downtime, but like struggling with depression. 14 are crippled with anxiety and fear. Seven are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Three are grieving over the death of a loved one. Uh, eight are struggling with the loss of a job. And 60 do not profess to be born again. And uh, that number is actually probably higher in our area. That's, these are national statistics. And nationally we have a time where we're struggling with joy, struggling with contentment, struggling with uh, life where we feel uh, kind of whole and complete and good about where things are at. And, and we looked at this more last week and so we're not going to have time to go over a lot of it again. But maybe you sense that. Maybe you see the same thing. Maybe, maybe you recognize this, this you know, national lack of happiness. You see it in, in, in uh, your family. You see the, the issues in, at your workplace. Um, the the, the uh, issues of finances that we're struggling with lately seem to have brought out kind of new challenges and new problems. Um, if you work with customers, those that I've talked to said they, you know, they're answering the phone, they're working with customers, they're finding it's more and more difficult to deal with people that are walking through the door or calling up. And they're struggling, uh, the, the people are just struggling in this area of joy, of happiness. And is there anything we can do? Well, I want to get right into our text this morning and talk about some things that Paul says will help us in the area of joy. Some things that we can learn. And we're in, in Philippians chapter 1. 
Last week we ended with verse 6, verse 7 and 8. Paul just again kind of talks about how his affection, his love for the church there at uh, Philippi and expresses that to them. And then we'll pick it up in verse 9 and begin our reading. And he says, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of my brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. I want to think about or look at and ask, what are the things that Paul prayed for them? What did he want for them? That if his prayer came true, if God honored this prayer and they received these things, that it would increase their joy and help them find the kind of contentment and satisfaction that Paul had come to know. And Paul says, this, this is my, my prayer for you. In other words, he's saying, this is what I really want for you. This is what I hope for you. This is what I pray for and pray towards. That, um, that you would have the best things in your life that God has for you. And he, he says a few things. I want to look specifically at three. For a fourth one that's going to kind of be embedded in this. But first of all, he says, he prays for them that their love may abound. Paul would want and hope for us that our love would abound, for the church in Philippi, that their love would abound. 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. This is similar to the idea that we had in um, talking about last week, that we call this ungoogleable joy because it's not joy that we kind of can build. It's not a joy that we can buy. It's not a joy that we can uh, search for on the internet and suddenly we can find it. It's, it's ungoogleable. It, it, it's, it's something you can't just go out. You can't, you can't smoke it or drink it or, or own it or anything. But instead it comes through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's a gift that's given to us. And, and in a similar fashion, what I just read in 1 John is love comes from God. We get love and God's love through knowing God. And Paul is praying too that our love would grow. And that we would abound in love. As your heart continually fills with love, it's also going to fill with God's joy. But how do we do that? How can we fill it with the kind of love that comes from God? Because let's face it, the love that we're most familiar with the love that we experience, the love that we see, uh, uh, the love that we know example of, is, is a love that's rather fleeting. It's a love that can be empty. It's a love that's here today and gone tomorrow. It's a love that's very dependent upon our emotions. And we can feel and act loving today and a moment later be filled with fear or doubt or anger. God's love is different. And we want to grow in God's love. Paul says that he wants us to abound in love. He says that happens through knowledge and depth of insight. That we grow in understanding of who God is and how much He loves us. And how He pours that love into our life. You see, there's, there's two things that are needed there. Knowledge, understanding of God and who He is. But he couples that and he says, and depth of insight. It's not just enough to know about God. There are a lot of people that know about God. They know things of Him. They know verses from the Bible. But they don't have depth of insight. And we need to understand the whole of God's story and know the depth of the sacrifice that He has made for us. And this is kind of the difference. Every other religion in the world, everyone is about climbing some kind of ladder to reach your idea of God. It's about learning 
uh, certain things. It's about knowledge. It's about attaining new levels. It's about sacrificing more and more. It's about memorization and study. It's, it, it, it's about climbing that ladder to be good enough or to do enough or to achieve enough to reach God. But we know that through grace, we don't have to climb that ladder. Instead, God climbed the ladder down. He came to us. He already loves us. He already accepts us. He already approves of us. He wants us to grow. He wants us to get better. We do some of the same things. But it's not because we're learning, or, or excuse me, earning His affection. It's not because we're trying to win His approval. It's not so that we can help Him to love us. We already have that in God. And we don't have to show off for Him. And we don't have to worry about being good enough for Him. We just have to move into relationship with Him and let Him love us and learn to love Him back. God as Jesus Christ came to earth and sacrificed Himself on the cross that you might have eternal life. And when you begin to accept the depths of that insight, everything in life begins to change. I was listening to um, Bill Hybels give a message on this topic. And he gave two tests about um, what, what you should be able to see in your life as you're growing in the depth of insight about the grace and love that God gives for us. He says two specific things begin to change. If you're really beginning to get it, if you really begin to, to understand it and grow in what it means that, uh, to know what God has done for us. He says, first off, the first thing is, we start becoming more gracious people. The more we know about God's grace for us, we become more gracious towards others. You begin to love, your love for others begins to grow. Your kindness for, towards others, your patience with others. As you begin to learn about the grace that you've received, then the grace you want to give to others around you. Is that a good picture of you? That you, because you know you've been forgiven, it becomes easier to forgive others. Because you know of how God loves you, you learn how to, learn, to love others. When you begin to learn that God has, for, has forgiven you and, and wants to move into your life, it becomes easier for you to build relationships with others. I just said that as we learn and understand God's grace and God's love, that we become more gracious ourselves. We see His patience for a way that we want to be. We see His kindness for a way we want to be. And we see His love as a way, as something that we want to be. The second thing is we should begin to recognize the more we understand about the depths of God's love and grace for us, the more you want to share that grace and love with others. And you want to be a part of continuing the story. You begin to understand that what you've received, you're able to give. And you want to share that message and share that God story. And you, and you so desperately want others to begin to live in God's story. And you, can, you, you become deeply concerned for those that are walking apart from God. You, become, you, you begin to hurt for, for a, a nation and a world that doesn't walk with the Savior and doesn't know the Savior and doesn't live with the Savior. You begin to get concerned for family and friends and neighbors that are not Christian and they're not born again. And you see a statistic flash on the wall that says 60 plus percent of our neighbors are not born again. Do not walk with Jesus Christ and do not have the promise of eternal life and your heart breaks. He said, I want to share the grace that I've come to know. And we begin to pray for those that are walking far from God. And we begin to, to weep for those that we wish would draw near to Him. And we can see our love is abounding in God. When we start seeing that that love is living with us and it wants to be shared. The second thing that Paul says in our text is that he wants us to discern what is best. And how many of us could use a little bit of simplification and order in our lives? 
Does anybody feel stressed, overwhelmed, uh, worn out? Does anybody feel like there's just more going on than, than sometimes you feel like you can handle? Paul says, I want you to learn how to discern what is best. Are you giving yourself to the best things in life? It's so easy to leave the most important things in your life up to chance. Couple examples. Do you have a date with your spouse as a priority on your calendar? Do you protect your time so that you have enough of it for family? Are there immutable appointments in your daily schedule that you have set aside for time with God and nothing is allowed to interfere with it? Are you building the best things into your daily routine and daily schedule? Do you have the appointments on your calendar that you know should be there? Or do you just kind of go through the day with a, well, we'll wait and see attitude? Now, obviously, you know, I, I don't know what your job is. I know in my life it's certainly true that I never know what my day is going to look like. I don't know who's going to walk through the door. I don't know who that is going to be on the other end of the, of the next phone call. I don't know what the next email is going to say. And it has a way of taking my day in a totally different direction than what I thought. Still, do we run our calendar in a way that the most important things, the best things, the things that we ought to do get first priority? Do you willingly move into problem areas of your life and do something to address them because you know it's vital and it's important? Do you try to uh, think about, visualize the person that you want to become? and set the appropriate goals, take the adequate steps, and work hard to become that person. Are you doing the best with your life that you can, or are you simply doing what's familiar and comfortable and easy, the things that just come along? Um, I can't tell you over the how many times somebody's come up to me and said, well, you know, I'm sorry that I missed church last week. Because usually it's something like, typically, if somebody's telling me that they miss church and the reason why, it's usually because they, uh, they slept through it or they're up too late the night before, um, you know, the, the, they were at some party till 2 a.m. or there was something more important going on the night before and the Sunday morning wasn't a priority because they hadn't got there yet. I know that there's a lot of people, they're reluctant these days to commit to volunteer to, for a project, to join a spiritual life group, to get involved in certain areas, because they don't know if a better opportunity might come along. Oh, I don't, I don't want to lock myself into something because when it comes, you know, what if I want to do something else? I mean, are you putting the most important things, the best things in your life? Um, I've kind of recognized that um, in, in helping people to deal with stuff in their life that there's kind of two kinds of people there's, there's, a, there's a kind of person that if they're going through a hard time they kind of come rushing they, 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 they come right in they want to talk about it they want to pray about it they want to deal with it they want to get help they want guidance they want to know how they can move through this, this tough spot and they, they find support, they find prayer encouragement, they, they hopefully find a little wisdom and direction, and they're able to move forward. Then there's another kind of person, they know they got problems in their life, and they know that I know it. <laughs> and they want to avoid me like the plague. <laughs> they're afraid, what am I going to ask? They're afraid, what are we going to talk about? They're afraid, am I going to point out some kind of difficult thing in their life? And I hope I do that gently and, and, and respectfully and with honor. But there's people that when dealing with a difficult problem in their life, they just don't want to see me. There was a couple I was working with several years ago. And they're not in the church. They never have been. Uh, and no one here would know them. But she was a believer and he was not. And they wanted to get married in the church. And he was willing to do that for her. And they came in and asked if I would do the ceremony. They didn't have a church of their own. 
And they asked if I would help them. And I said, well, I could help you with that. But I do require, the church requires, five to six weeks of counseling first. Well, he wasn't real happy about that. And, but he, again, he was willing because that's what she wanted. And so we met for two or three weeks. And he wouldn't answer a single question. He wouldn't do any homework assignments. He did nothing except sit there with this grumpy face and this, this attitude and this countenance that you could just see. And it was just getting thicker and thicker in the room every time we met. And I was trying to be kind. I would just ask, what do you think about this? What do you think is important in your relationship? I mean, tell me about yourself. How did you guys meet? Let, you know, just, just share with me your story. I mean, just even general questions about the relationship. And this guy was closing up tighter and tighter every week and resented being there. And it finally got to a session where I just asked him, what, what was the problem? What's the deal? This is, getting married is the most important, yet the most difficult situation you will deal with in all of your life. And I'm not here to change you. I'm not here to, to make you get through me so that you can get married. Everything I'm doing is just to be a help and a support and to pray with you. And, and I don't understand why you're so being so difficult about it. If you don't want to be here, I have better things to do. And I just laid it out to him. And his, I'm thinking his uh, fiance had some words with him that week because he came in with a better attitude <laughs> the following week and we finished it out. He never really opened up. He never really appreciated his time, our time together. I don't know how much he learned. Um... It's probably one of those marriages where I had more concern about their relationship than anybody else I've worked with. Although, I, they're still together and what I can tell, they're, I just see them once in a while and catch up here and there. So they're making it through. But do you want the right things for your life or just what's right now? Paul says we need to be doing the best that we can and watch out for the distractions and the derailments that will steal away our life and our joy because we're not working on the things that are best. If you pay attention to the most important things, the best things, then he goes on to say you can be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes only from Christ. And oftentimes, the, the best things are not necessarily the easiest things. They're certainly not the most spectacular things. They're not the things that are, are, you know, that are screaming for our attention. They're not always the things that we really want to do, at least on the front side. But we have to be asking the question, who do we want to become? Do you want to reap the rewards of a sinful life? Wasting it away, partying it off, becoming like the rest of the world? Or do you want to become more like Jesus? Which one do you think is best? And so are you putting your time and putting your attention and putting the things on your calendar and your schedule that will help you become like Jesus? Or are you wasting your time on the things of the world? If we want joy... And Paul says, then focus on what's best. Put your attention towards what's best and build that into your life. Make God and time with Christ a priority. Make His Word something that you want in your life. Make sure that you protect your schedule so that the best things go in first. And look at where your life is going and where you want it to be. And work on the things that are best. Now, Third, I got an extra one on there for you. The, the fruit of righteousness, I think, is the benefit. It's what you're filled with if you do the things that are best. But the, the one I just want to kind of finish out with this morning is in verse 12, he says, that we should be about advancing the gospel. At the beginning of the church, Paul was... He, in uh, Acts chapter 16, it tells a story where he goes down to a little river, a little watering area, to pray. 
He finds a little, kind of a quiet spot. While he's there, he finds some other women who are down there first, and they're, you know, getting, getting to the water. And he meets a girl by the name of Lydia. And while he's there at the water, and he's had his prayer time, and he begins to talk with some other people, and during that time, he, um, he engages some kind of conversation with this lady, and she is already a worshiper of God, but she turns in faith to Jesus Christ. And that begins... She's the first convert, then her, then her family all gets baptized there in this, in this stream, probably. At least uh, tradition believes that in the same stream, they all get baptized there. And that's kind of the genesis, the beginning of this church. Well, now, Pastor Mark Wheeler, many of you know him from Lidgewood Presbyterian. Uh, a good friend, he and I did the pulpit swap last year. He just got back from a trip through Greece. And um, he went to Philippi, and we were talking about his trip. And I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm teaching right now through Philippians. What, do you have any photos? Uh, and he shared with me some, and I'll share a few over the next couple of weeks. But, but I have a picture, and this is the... Um, there's now a, a kind of a, a shrine area there now, but this is the river where Lydia met Paul gave her life to Jesus Christ and they started the church in Philippi that we're reading about today. And he's going through the, the different pictures and stuff and he showed that river and, and something just kind of leapt inside of me. I thought, wow, that's the spot where this church began. That's a spot where, where Paul led this, this woman and her whole family to Jesus Christ. That's the place where it started. And now... Almost 2,000 years later, we're still talking about this letter that he wrote to this church that he loved. That today we could learn a little bit more about joy. Paul's life was about sharing and advancing the gospel. And we've got to be about the business of advancing the gospel. Because you know, what I found is everything else in life... Turns mundane. I, I got to be honest. I was talking with the the worship team this morning, and uh, Grayson had us uh, read about the armor of God. And uh, as we were talking about it, we read through the scripture. It just kind of um, ref kind of brought back to me or, or challenged me that every piece of the armor is about protection. Every, every piece of the armor that you put on, the, the, the helmet of salvation and, and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth that holds us together, and all these pieces of armor in this, in this picture that's being drawn for us um, is, is about protecting ourselves because we have an evil one that is trying to destroy us. And it just kind of dawned on me, you know, last week we started... Uh, a series on joy and for whatever reason this last week I just kind of been feeling icky <laughs> been kind of feeling you know a little down and discouraged uh, not for any reason nothing's changed nothing's different nothing's going on it's just that these times in life come and, and, and I'm just kind of going man it just you know, I'm just going, you know, doing this and that, and some things aren't working, and other things are problems, and you know, it's day after day, and and and, and you're just kind of going through these motions. Does any of it really matter? Is anything going anywhere? And I was reminded that the only thing that's forever, the only thing that really matters, the only thing is eternal, is that we do the work of advancing the gospel. And here, thousands of years later, we talk about a woman that came to faith, a family that came to faith, a city that, where a church was born and began ministering to their community. And Paul says, if you, want to, if you want joy, then do the work of advancing the gospel. Um, click down one, Donde. We talked about this on on Wednesday and I've been trying to really 
kind of get my mind wrapped around it. Um, but uh, we've talked a lot about the missional thinkers and the missional church and what that might look like. And that we want to be a people that are on mission. And sometimes what we tend to do is we think that, well, we're a church and then we do mission. A lot of times we think of ourselves that way as Christians. We have a life that we're trying to live and that life is surrounded by all kinds of stuff. We go to work and we have a family and we got to uh, uh, you know, take care of our yards and we go to church and we do classes and we get involved in our communities and maybe you, you know, you're a part of some kind of other group uh, club or hobby interest that you have and we have all this stuff that we that, that we just you know fill our life with and then occasionally we add mission and somehow we have to kind of squeeze it we have to fit it in we have to find a way you know the preacher said something that made you feel kind of guilty that you haven't shared your faith in a while you know, or you were in a Bible study or you read a verse and it said, you know, something that you feel, oh man, I really should, you know, join a, uh, uh, some, you know, some project and volunteer for something because uh, I know I'm supposed to. And we find ways to take mission and squeeze it into our already busy and overcrowded life. And some folks are saying, you know what, God has built a natural rhythm into our lives, things that we do and are part of every day. What if we, instead of squeezing mission into our life, we made mission our life? And it wasn't an addition to our life, it was an intention of our life. And they said, what if our life wasn't about adding mission to it, but we saw that everything in our life was a mission. Our life is lived as mission. And so everything that we're already doing, we just are going to add gospel intentionality to it. How could, I, how could I live out the mission of advancing the gospel in everything that I do? So God has a story. My life has, interact, has intersected that story as well as every other person that I meet. And I want, to, I want to know God's story by studying His Word. I want to think about how my life intersects with that story and it changes me because of it and my testimony grows. But I also want to learn the stories of other people around me. Where did you come from? What's, a, what's going on in your life? Are things good right now or are you going through a tough time? How can we just meet people and learn their story? And find ways to tell our story back with them. To do that, we need to learn to be listeners. We need to learn how to listen to God. We need to learn how to listen to others around us and hear their story. How can we open up our ears to other people? To what God's saying to us and how He's moving and molding us and, 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 and moving us where He wants to send us and do what He wants to do with us? How can, we, how can we open our ears to Him? And then just open our ears to those around us. Paul just walks down to the river. He went to pray while he was there. Uh, maybe it was after his prayer time or, 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 or whatever, but he just goes down there prayer and he notices there's some other people and he just starts a conversation to find out um, what's going on in their lives and in their city. And he leads this woman to Christ. How can we listen to others? Then he says, uh, next, he said, we need to learn how to celebrate. If we have God's grace and love, we have the greatest reason to celebrate in all the world. Nobody else should be able to party like the Christians. Because we're the only ones that have a reason to party. And we know how to do it right. We can do it. We can party and celebrate in a way that doesn't destroy our lives. We get to party for real reasons and have real joy. And so we should, we should be able to freely move into the celebrations, have celebrations, enjoy other people's celebrations, getting involved in things going on in, in the neighborhood. If, the, if, the, if your block is having some kind of a block party, why not be there? If there's things that are going on that we can celebrate, why not be there? Just get involved. I mean, didn't we see Jesus at, at some of the parties around town? Uh, the bottom one, you can't see the bottom word, sorry, it got kind of uh, jumbled up there, but it says eat. 
You know, we all eat. We, um, we recognize that we have to eat. Why not eat with non-believers? Spend some time. We can hear their story and listen to them. We can share our story as we're eating together. And we can just, just share meals together. But the reality is the longer we are Christian, the less likely we are to actually sit at the table with a non-Christian. Well, what if we used our eating times? We have to eat three times a day anyways. Why not use some of that as an opportunity to sit with a non-believer and just share stories? Um, be a blessing. The whole reason God blesses us is that we might be a blessing to others. Look for ways to help, to, to encourage, to provide for, to come alongside. What could you do to be a blessing to others in your life? Uh, and then the last one, recreate. Um, we were talking on Wednesday, you know, Elon, uh, everybody knows Elon and his, his uh, little white motorcycle. And he added a, a little sticker on the back with three crosses on it. And he joined the Christian Motorcycle Association. Something he loves to do and he's looking for ways to leverage it for Jesus Christ. With his little symbol, with uh, the club that he's a part of. And they're actively out doing things. Sometimes they just go for a ride, but other times they'll go, they'll, u they'll use a ride and turn it into a prayer ride or a way to go volunteer. They volunteered out at Silverwood last couple weeks ago. But he's taking something he already enjoys and he's using it with gospel intentionality. What are some things that you already enjoy doing for recreation or for rest or, or creativity? And how could you use that to share God's story in the rest of the world. The problem is we tend to huddle. We tend to, we'll share God's story with people that already know the story. That's the only ones we want to share the story with. How can we use the things in our life that we're already doing to share it with others? That we could be a blessing and we could just show that we are rested we're relaxed. We have energy. We have joy because we know how to rest in the arms of Jesus Christ. We need to be examples. Unfortunately, today, when the world looks at the Christians, they don't always see somebody that they really want to be like. How can we use our life to advance the gospel? Paul says, this is what I pray for you. I pray that you would abound in love, that you would search out the best things in your life, and that helps you to become a witness into the rest of the world so that you can advance the gospel.